Mark chapter 9, please. Mark chapter 9. I'm going to stand reading. You say, I thought you were going to preach on prayer. I'm going to preach on what the preacher said, something that will stir your soul to pray. Amen. In uh, Mark chapter 9, and reading from verse 36. And he took a child, that is the Lord Jesus, and set him in the midst of them, the apostles and disciples. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto men, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us, and we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. A millstone in biblical times weighed many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Some folks think at least 5,000 pounds that it smashed the grain with as they rolled it around. And the Bible said that you'd be better off to have that hung about your neck and cast into the bottom of the sea uh, than to offend uh, one of these little ones that believe in me. Parents, get both ears open. Get both ears open and listen to that statement. Grandma and Grandpa, get both ears open and listen to that statement. Uh, I just say to you, you have something to do with a little one, you better look up. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life main than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm doth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. For the worm doth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. For the worm doth not, and the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire. Every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. I was praying and studying, as I often do, and I was in my study about uh, five, six weeks ago, and uh, God said, Tom, I want to give you a sermon today, and I want it preached in every church where you preach. If you'll notice, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he got ready to talk about hell, he took a child in his arms and helped that child on his lap while he taught on the subject of hell. You say, preacher, why would he do that? Because a child ought to know there's a hell, and your children ought to know there's a hell, and your neighbors ought to know there's a hell, and we ought to be preaching hell. And he said, Tom, the preachers have quit preaching on hell. And I'm not saying every preacher. I'm just saying, as I travel church to church, I ask, how long has it been since you preached a full sermon on hell? And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And I've asked church members, how long has it been since you had a, heard a sermon on hell? And they said, I can't remember how long it's been. You know, hell occupies a great space in the New Testament. It occupies a great space in the Old Testament. There is a hell. There is a hell. And uh, in the, the Scriptures, we are told uh, in the 16th chapter of Luke, 
And the 26th verse, if you want to turn there quickly, uh, you may do so. It's a very familiar verse in Luke and chapter 16 and in verse 26. And notice, if you would please, and beside all this, Lazarus has asked, uh, the rich man has asked that Abraham send Lazarus, dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. And he said, there's a great gulf beside all this. Between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And so we see the chasm of hell, the chasm of hell. The Bible says there's a great gulf fixed between heaven and hell's location. It's a great gulf. I studied the word gulf. I looked it up in the Greek, uh, and uh, it can be a gorge, something maybe a uh, type of the Royal Gorge in Colorado, 1,000 feet deep and uh, very extensive in size. It could be the Grand Canyon as an example of that. The Grand Canyon is 277 miles long. It's 18 miles wide, and it's 6,000 feet deep. It could be a lot of things. Uh, if you take the Gulf of Mexico, that's the only bottle, a body of water anywhere that we would recognize that's called a Gulf. The Gulf of Mexico is a very large Gulf. It is 16, uh, 617,800 square miles. 617,800 square miles. And that Texas is only 268,000. The Gulf of Mexico is almost three times as large as the state of Texas. It is in places 14,300 feet deep. Uh, it is a gulf. It is a gulf. Luke said, and God said in the book of Luke, that there is a great gulf. Now imagine the gulfs that I've just described to you, and please understand our space, our space. When you take the, ba the laser beam of the bell system and aim it at the moon, it goes out there and back in three and one quarter seconds at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. If you take that same laser beam and aim it at the nearest star in the galaxy uh, in which we live, the Milky Way galaxy, it takes it 100,000 years traveling at the speed of light of 186,000 miles per second. It takes it 100,000 years to get there. They now tell us that there are over 200,000 galaxies beyond ours. Uh, let me say to you, space is a vast, vast thing. And the Bible says between where paradise was and where hell was in the Old Testament, there was a great gulf fixed, and nobody could pass over it from either direction. And when God sets up the eternal hell and people are cast into that, it's going to be an inseparable gulf. It's going to be a gulf that you cannot imagine and I cannot imagine. There is a place called hell. And it is a great gulf between us and it between the paradise and there. And when Christ rose from the dead, he emptied paradise and moved it to heaven. And Paul said, for now the Christian to die is to be absent of the body, present with the Lord. Thank God for that. Thank God that he made a way. Nobody in the Old Testament could go straight to heaven because Christ had not died and risen again. Satan is the God of the principality of the air, and nobody had made a way through his territory to get to heaven. And the Bible says in chapter 3 of John, who hath ascended, who hath descended, and descended. Only Christ could do that through the devil's territory and uh, the angels that he commissioned. Let me say to you, there's a hell. There's a hell. But we have quit believing in hell. You listen to us pray, and we don't pray about folks about hell. We pray about heaven. I did my father-in-law's funeral back in February, 
uh, and uh, uh, all the time. And I, I'm glad people talk about heaven. And everybody there uh, just about that gave a testimony or something was saying heaven, heaven, heaven. And I got up to preach the, the message, and I said, I love heaven with all of my heart, but I'd be the worst preacher in the world not to tell you there's a hell. There's a hell. There's a hell. My friend, we've quit believing in hell, and preachers, even in fundamentalism, have quit preaching about hell. Well, I want to say to you today, God told me, Tom, everywhere you go, you preach this, and I want you to understand there's not only the chasm of hell, there's the chains of hell. There's the chains of hell. If you look in your Bible in 2 Peter and 2.4, 2 Peter and chapter 2 and uh, verse Four. And the Bible says here that for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Peter, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, tells us that in hell the darkness is so thick that it binds like a chain. It holds those fallen angels there for eternity. That's why those demons there in the fifth chapter of Mark, they cried out, don't send us, don't send us, don't send us. Let us go over there in those pigs. And down in the bottom of the Sea of Galilee today are 2,000 demons living in those pigs' heart. That The pigs are gone, but the demons are there, and they're bound there. You say, I never heard of such a thing. You may not have heard of the two angels in the in the river of Euphrates that God created and put there. And they've been there all of these centuries and they'll only be called up for a short duty of the glory of God. And here, these are chains of darkness. In heaven, we have light. In hell, they have dark, 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 dark. There's a, there's a, a, a darkness in the Bible back in the books of Exodus, if you'd like to turn there for a moment. And notice what it says about God causing a great dark a great darkness to come over the land of Egypt and the land uh, where they were there. In the 10th chapter of the book of Exodus, I call your attention to the 21st verse. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Watch, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick, thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. Three days they saw not one another, neither rose any man from his place for three days for three days, if that man was milking a cow and that darkness came, he would sit right there for three days there by that cow. If he was riding a horse, the horse may have stopped, but he was sitting on that horse. The Bible said no man rose from his place. If he was in bed when this darkness came, he was there for three days. It was a darkness that bound them where they were and they couldn't get away from it. The Bible talks about that. And then if you will look at the book of the Revelation and chapter 20 for a moment, the book of the Revelation and chapter 20, I call your attention to verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the old dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose a little season. God binds up things. He's, he bound the people of, in Egypt there where they couldn't move for three days. He talks about the chains that are in hell. The chains of darkness used to when you could go through the Carlsbad Caverns out in New Mexico. Uh, you, could, you could go all the way down the bottom. You were a mile deep down there, and they would turn out the lights, and then they would put on the song, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. It was an awesome, awesome thing. Uh, it just made chills. You couldn't see anything. You couldn't even see the person standing right beside you. That's what it says here. They didn't see anybody. They couldn't leave their place. 
and in hell there are chains of darkness uh, and uh, it's an awful time in hell 31 times in your Old Testament in the New Testament 22 times you'll find hell and uh, you, you find the Lord Jesus Christ 11 times speaking on hell in the, the New Testament he seemed to reserve that subject to himself Paul never wrote about hell Peter said very little about hell Matthew said very little about hell Mark said very little about hell uh, Jesus left the major part of the teaching of hell on himself and I say to you he did that so that you and I would get it right ex from the word of God right from the lips of the son of God that there is a place called hell I want you to understand the liberals may put out the fire but God hasn't and uh, they may yank away the teaching out. But David said, even if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Dear friend, there is a hell. You not only have the chains of hell, the chasm of hell, you have the cries from hell. The cries from hell. Uh, please understand uh, that people in hell over and over in your New Testament, and I can take you to verse after verse, the Bible said, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. When ye yourselves see Jacob and Isaac and Abraham in heaven in the eighth chapter of the book of Matthew, he said, you're going to weep and you're going to wail and you're going to gnash your teeth because they're in and you're not and it isn't ever going to change. Heaven is forever, but so is hell forever. In heaven they have a river that makes glad the city of God. Every mansion in heaven has stream frontage. There's water everywhere. In hell there's not so much as a drop of water. He said, you send Lazarus and let him stick his finger in water. Go home after this message this morning. Take some water, stick your finger in it, pull it out and come back tonight and tell me how much was on the end of your finger. I'll tell you how much it is because of the, of the oil in your skin system. You'll have less than a full drop of water. He said, if I could just get a drop of water, Lazarus, just a drop of water, uh, Abraham, just a drop to cool my parched tongue. Friend, there is no water in hell. There's no light in hell. These, these miners that are trapped underground in some of these coal caves and so forth, and they cave in, they tell me that they stare and stare and stare and stare until their eyes ache, and, and, and they begin to just tears run down their face, and, and their eyes get bloodshot. And you know what they're looking for? They're looking for one little tiny smidgen of of light because if there's light there's hope there's some air somewhere somebody's going to find us but there's not so much as a light in hell not so much as a, just a, a smidgen of light in hell it is darkness 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 the people in hell never see anybody they just hear them weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth I say to you dear friend we have forgotten that he forgotten that how in God's name could we go to bed at night without praying how could we not get up in the morning and pray if we really believe that our children that are lost are going to hell how could we do that if we believe that our soldier boys and girls that could be killed at any time will go straight to hell if they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. How could we put off the talking to our relatives and our friends and our neighbors and our workers that we work with? If we really believed there was a hell, we'd get our mouth open. If we really believed there was a hell, we'd kneel by our beds and we'd get up in the morning and we'd prostrate ourselves on the floor and we'd pray and we'd pray and we'd pray, and we'd pray Jesus sin it's better it's better to cut off your leg and go to heaven it's better to pluck out your eyes and go to heaven it's better for you to cut off your foot I don't know what's keeping you from God this morning but if it's what your feet can do for you get rid of them 
Get rid of them. If it's what you can read with your eyes that causes you not to believe in hell or causes you not to see lost souls, when you drive down the streets of Allen or Chicago or anywhere else, I challenge you, don't see people. See souls. See souls. Everlasting, eternal souls because they're going to heaven or hell, one or the other. Some people think I'm a little too straight uh, when I wrote this track. Uh, you're going to die. When will you die? And I got a tombstone on the front of it, but on the back I close this track. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. If you don't go to heaven, you will go to hell. Dear friend, understand, understand, there's a hell. There's the cries from hell. And then I challenge you, and I could give you verse after verse on that. But look at the last one. There's a conversation from hell. Turn back to Luke chapter 16, would you please? Luke and chapter 16. And we'll hear not only the chasm of hell, the chains of hell, the cries of hell, but we'll see the conversation from hell. Notice there is a conversation going on in this. And it says the rich man died and he was buried and Abraham and uh, Lazarus was taken to the bosom of Abraham and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom and he cried and said Father Abraham have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue I am tormented in this flame but Abraham said said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this between un us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they would, would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Let me say to you this morning, listen, young person, listen, mother and daddy, listen to me this morning. There's no sex parties in hell. There's no liquor parties in hell. There's no dope, no dope parties in hell. I want you to understand, in hell, there's a prayer meeting this morning, and they're praying that you'll go back, and if you've got a brother that's in hell, you'll go tell the rest of the family, there's a hell, there's a hell there's a hell. He said, go back. Tell my five brothers. I don't want them in this place. I don't want them here. You've got a relative in hell. They don't want you there. They want you in heaven. They want you to repent of your sin today and turn to Jesus Christ and be saved. Dear friend, there's a conversation here going on in hell that tells us exactly what they're thinking. I call your attention this morning uh, just for a moment uh, that in uh, turn to the book of the Revelation and chapter 9. The book of the Revelation and uh, chapter 9. In Revelation 9, the Bible tells us in verse 1, uh, and the fifth angel <coughs> cried out and sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Verse 2, and he opened the bottomless pit. Verse 11, please. Verse 11. And no, notice as the scripture continues here. <clears throat> and and uh, the Bible says in uh, chapter 9 and uh, verse 11, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek he tongue he has the name Apollyon. And then notice chapter 11 and verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit, he came out of the bottomless pit. Notice the chapter uh, <clears throat> 17, please. Chapter 17 and uh, verse 8. Chapter 17 and verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and is yet. And it says in verse 8, a bottomless pit. Notice Revelation uh, chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. 
and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit. Notice, if you would, please, in verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit. Pit. One, of the tr- one of the great atrocities of hell is it is a bottomless pit. You never hit. And when you're falling, you, 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 you get this and you think, I'm going to hit at any second. I know I'm going to hit any second. And you don't hit. And you go that way for a thousand years, and it's drawn up like a knot, but you don't hit. And you're never going to hit. You're just going to fall and fall and fall and fall, expecting to hit at any moment moment, any second, but you don't, and then you tighten up for it. It's got to come now. I know I'm going to hit now, but the Bible says again and again and again and again, it is a bottomless pit. The the Bible talks about remembering, remembering, remembering in hell. He said, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime in heaven all things are passed away. We won't remember this. We won't remember uh, the people here. It's all gone. It's all gone. He said, and I, I will take it all away. In heaven you have no remembrance of anything here. Uh, let me say to you, dear friend, in hell they never forget. They never forget. They never forget their atrocities. They never forget the dope that they love. They never forget the drunkenness of the delirious tremors. If you've ever seen these drunks with delirious tremors, they see a a venomous creature coming out of the drain in the floor. They see another one creeping out of the faucet. If you've ever been with them, I've been with them numerous times. And they scream and they draw up and they scream and they scream for it to go away. And that's exactly what's going on in hell. They weep and they wail and they gnash their teeth. Let me say to you, they remember uh, in uh, 2000, uh, back in 1960s, I lived in Los Angeles uh, and a man there abducted a little seven-year-old girl uh, out, of, out of the front yard. He took her to the mountains. They never uh, could find him. And he took that little girl and then later they finally caught up with the man. But he took that little girl and he was brought in for trial and the judge sentenced him to die in the gas chamber. Uh, and the, uh, and the, 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 the judge was sentencing him there. And the judge, he said to the judge, judge, I'm a man. I can die like a man. But he said, I'm telling you, I can't shut my eyes. I can't sleep. But what that little girl's face is right there in front of me saying, please, mister, please, please, I'm just a little girl. Please, mister, I want my mother, please. And he chewed her breasts off, and he did everything to her body that a human being could do under demonic leading. And the judge sentenced that man to death. But that man is dead, and he's been dead ever since the 1960s. I want you to understand, in hell, that man sees that little girl's face, and he screams, and he cries, and he begs, but it don't go away, and it won't go away. It'll be there forever, standing in front of him. You say, what kind of a God would make a place like you're talking about? The same God that sent his son to die on Calvary's cross. The same God, the Bible says, took our iniquities and put them on his own son. And like one giant human ink blotter, the son of God received my sin and your sin until Peter wrote in 224, and I, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. On the tree, Jesus became a harlot. On the tree, Jesus Jesus became a drunkard on the tree. Jesus became, my friend, every kind of sin that there was. And he absorbed it and absorbed it and absorbed it until it was over. And he cried, it's finished. And I want you to understand, he bore our sins on the cross. He went to hell for us. You say Christ in hell? Acts chapter 2 said he went to hell. If he didn't take your hell, you will. You'll have to pay the price in hell if he didn't pay it. But thank God he did. Thank God he defeated hell. And he defeated the grave. And he defeated the devil. And took from him the keys of life and death. Dear friend, I beg you this morning. I beg you this morning. If we really believed in hell, we would pray. We would pray for our loved ones. We wouldn't worry about the clock. We'd cut off the sports channel and we'd turn down the magazines and throw them away. And I'm saying to you, dear folk, we must pray. We have to pray. There's a hell.